And Andrew Weissman here, Laura Jarrett, is inside the courtroom, and she's describing the judge's affect, that he was speaking slowly, uh, very, very, as you've heard inside and I heard inside. He speaks very calmly and slowly and, and deliberately, even when he was chiding the defense lawyer or the prosecution in various instances. Right. Um, I really wish for that reason that at least there was an audio. I mean, the, the Supreme Court audio has been so helpful to us. Exactly. You can actually simultaneously listen to arguments now. And one of the more striking things is hearing uh, Judge Marchand's voice at a time when there's so much um, distrust in our legal system being fomented by Donald Trump and others. It would be so helpful to hear that because that was the first thing that struck me. Um, Laura's reporting in terms of what was going on this morning, which was the reading for about an hour of the jury instructions and the uh, jurors being wrapped to attention, um, makes total sense. I mean, this is when they actually find, you know, what is the law? What do they have to find or not find? Um, so they're given all these instructions, and the reporting is that they were you know, paying very, very close attention to that, as, as you would expect. And, and describe the rapport between the judge and the jurors in this case, in many cases. Yeah, I mean, almost all jurors, unless you've got a really erratic judge, um, develop a, a real bond with a judge. They're, you know, the judge, he or she, is looking out for the jurors. They're just paying careful attention to their time, is making things move along. Um, and with, as you've noted, with respect to Judge Marchand, I mean, I am, I am like now, you know, I have like a man crush on him. <laughs> right. He is such a great judge that it's hard to see that the jurors wouldn't have the same impression. I mean, he's just, you just keep on thinking, if you looked in a dictionary for like judicial temperament, that's what you get. And just remember, he has had to put up with a defendant who committed 10 acts of a contempt who's threatened not just him but his family and instead in spite of all of that you would not know for a second that that is in any way weighing on him because it has just been such an impeccably fair trial which is you know just a fascinating uh, context here especially given all of the ruckus and social media and out in outside the courtroom judge jones talk about that so what is the most critical part of the jury instructions that you saw today and how they could sway the outcome? Did any side benefit at all from the way the judge well, described the law here? Well, first of all, uh, Andrew is precisely correct. I want to just comment on that. Uh, it, jurors do cleave to the uh, trial judge, and particularly this trial judge, who was so even-tempered and I thought did an exemplary job with a tough case. Uh, uh, Andrew couldn't be uh, more correct. Uh, as far as the, the instructions are concerned, I, I think the instructions on the law uh, itself, broad as they were, uh, giving the, the jury some room uh, to find these uh, underlying uh, so-called predicate crimes, uh, those are very, very important uh, in, the, uh, in the jury's deliberations. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, in New York, you can't take the uh, instructions uh, to the jury room with you. I, we did that in the federal system, as uh, your panelists know, uh, and that was always helpful to the jury, but you, you have what you have. I do think there's going to be some questions. No uh, juror, lawyer or otherwise, can memorize um, pages and pages of, of intricate law. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, that may slow the deliberations. But, but otherwise, uh, I think it's the substantive law, the law of the case, as we call it, uh, that is going to be most important in the, in the uh, deliberations. And there was a slight delay in them actually starting to deliberate, I should point out, because two of the jurors needed instructions on how to use the laptop, which had the evidence loaded. Jeremy, uh, let's talk about all of that. I mean, this brings it all home to all of us who've dealt with technology as things have evolved, but there were two jurors who were not that familiar with the laptop. So it's, it's, not, it's funny is not the right word, but I just recently had a trial in Brooklyn Supreme Court uh, where the jury wanted to access certain things with the computer. And what they have to do, meaning the court system and the district attorney's office as well, is to make sure, and, and the defense, is that that laptop is clean. It's not internet accessible. Uh, there's nothing on there other than whatever tool or whatever they need to look at is on that laptop. And believe it or not, it took us probably three or four hours for the court system in the state of New York or the city of New York to get a laptop, to clean it up, to make sure it was accessible and usable. And while there was a delay, at least initially, it's a really effective tool for a jury to use to synthesize what they need to and then move that ball 
forward to either an acquittal or conviction. Or and another little bit of housekeeping. There are six alternates. And it was notable to me that they were not dismissed as the deliberation started. They can't participate in deliberations. Are they being kept in case someone gets sick and then they could be brought up to speed? I mean, well, is there... And again, I'll use the term funny. That's exactly what happened in my most recent trial. I lost one and then I lost a second juror and one of the jurors was substituted. Uh, doesn't matter ultimately the other juror came back, but um, they're critical, but they're not involved in that initial deliberation. They're separate and apart, but they also have to be involved in that entirety of the deliberation. They don't just come on at the end and say, we have 11 jurors, you're the 12th, what do you want to do? They have to be immersed in that process to ensure that the accused has that fair due process rights and that case is proven beyond a reasonable doubt. So, Barb, we just got the transcript, as we do on a de somewhat delayed basis, 55 pages of the judge's instructions that lasted a little more than an hour. A partial verdict is a possibility. Let's talk about the first seven counts. They're tied to the two checks that were uh, not signed by Donald Trump. So even if the jury finds him not guilty on those first counts, it, it could change. It could all change on count eight. Could you break it down for us? Yeah, absolutely. Each of these 34 counts has to be looked at uh, individually. And so it seems quite possible that the jury could find guilt on some counts and uh, not guilt proven on other counts. In fact, in some ways, if you're an appellate lawyer, uh, this is a, a godsend. It's a gift because it demonstrates that the jury did not look at it in an all or nothing fashion, but carefully looked and parsed each count in the indictment. And so, for example, it could be that the jury finds, as you said, the signed checks show guilt and Donald Trump's direct participation. Unsigned checks, maybe there's a reasonable doubt. Same with regard to invoices and ledger entries, where the prosecution's theory is that Donald Trump caused them to be created, but didn't create them himself. And so I think the strength of the evidence is strongest on the checks that he signed himself. I think there's certainly evidence on the other documents that he caused them to be executed. But you're right, Andrea, that the, ju that the jury will have to look at each of these individual. But from the prosecution's perspective, guilt on any one count is success because that brings with it a felony conviction. And so although there's 34 ways to guilty here, guilt on even one count is a conviction for the former president. And Judge Jones, how much influence will the judge have, especially if the jury comes back with questions at various times? Well, I don't, I don't think uh, influence would be um, uh, exactly the, the correct uh, word, uh, uh, Andrea. I think it's up to the judge to take the questions, for example, coalesce with the lawyers and find the right way uh, to answer the questions uh, and, and not to show uh, that he's leaning one way or the other uh, with respect to the answers. And it, it's kind of an art form uh, to do it. There are some questions, uh, as uh, your panelists know, that uh, judges, after coalescing with the attorneys, have to say to the jury, I'm sorry, but I just can't answer that question uh, for you. It's, it's not an appropriate question. It's, it's out of bounds. Uh, I'm going to instruct you to go back to the jury room and continue to deliberate. Um, so how he manages the jury um, is going to really help uh, the jury in its deliberations generally, but I don't think uh, he'll influence the jury. He doesn't want to influence the jury. Uh, they're the finders of fact, uh, per se. I uh, expect, given his qualifications, his vast experience as a trial judge, he knows exactly what he's doing. He's in the moment, and he'll handle uh, inquiries from the jury uh, very, very well.